So I was just going to tell you how I intend to use the time allocated to me, and I, I'll begin from from start. So uh, after a brief introduction in, in which I, I try to situate the, the work of the International Law Commission on the protection of the environment in relation to armed conflicts, in the context of international environmental law and in the context of the law of armed conflict, and I'll do it very briefly. Then I would like to give you an overview of the PERAC principles. And thereafter, I wish to discuss more in depth uh, four clusters of principles, also highlighting some of the issues that uh, were raised and the challenges encountered uh, during the work on the topic. And finally, I will say a few words of the work that remains to be done to ensure better protection of the environment in armed conflict and in post-conflict situations, in conflict-affected areas. And we'll also have time, I think, even with this slight break, we'll have time for questions and answers. So if we look at uh, how the situation of armed conflict has been addressed in international environmental law, or how environmental protection has been addressed or is regulated in the law of armed conflict, the record is fairly modest. Um, regarding the law of armed conflict, there is some uh, treaty law, as you can see, and I will come back to these provisions in a while. As far as uh, international environmental law is concerned, armed conflicts have been referred to in both of the seminal declarations of the Stockholm Conference in 1972 and the Rio Conference in 1992. The Stockholm Declaration contains a principle on the elimination of nuclear weapons and all other means of mass destruction. Several of the principles of the Rio Declaration are relevant to armed conflicts, but principles 23 and 24 are the most explicit ones. Unfortunately, there has been hardly any follow-up with regard to these two principles. To illustrate, um, I looked at the major textbook Principles of International Environmental Law by Philip Sands and uh, Jacqueline Peel, fourth edition of 2018. This is a textbook that is known uh, and appreciated for its comprehensive nature. Would you like to guess how many pages out of 968 deal with armed conflicts? 100? 50, 10, <laughs> actually nine. And these nine pages do not really uh, deal with international environmental law. They deal with, uh, there's a summary of uh, the relevant uh, law of armed conflict rules that you can see here. There are some, uh, references to relevant uh, UN Security Council practice, and a short mention of the then ongoing work in the International Law Commission on the Pena Principles. We'll now have a closer look at the law of armed conflict and how it addresses the problem of environmental uh, degradation and devastation. Let me add that uh, the law of armed conflict, also known as international humanitarian law, is a profoundly anthropocentric uh, branch of the international law. Throughout the history of the efforts to regulate warfare, the focus has always been on the protection of civilians. There's an extensive body of the law of armed conflict codified since the, the 19th century, but, but 
hold that body of law is concerned or primarily concerned with um, the, the protection of civilians and not the protection of the environment. The steps that have been taken to reduce wartime environmental harm have been prompted by particularly shocking events, such as the mass spreading of herbicides during the Vietnam War, here the picture, which led to the adoption of the Convention on Environmental Modification in 1976, and the addition of two environmental provisions to additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, adopted in 1977. The NMOD Convention prohibits um, military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques as a means of destruction, damage, or injury to another state. When such techniques have widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects. The first of the relevant additional protocol one provisions prohibits um, the use of any methods and means of warfare that are intended or may be expected to produce widespread long-term and severe damage to the natural environment. The second provision prohibits uh, the natural environment. It requires the state's parties to take uh, care to protect the natural environment from widespread long-term and severe damage. And then there's a provision that prohibits uh, reprisals against the natural environment. And in addition, the same uh, threshold of widespread long-term and severe damage uh, has been repeated in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in the definition of an environmental war crime. While these provisions are not identical, there are slight differences. They all set a very high threshold for prohibited action. At the time of the negotiations of the, the Additional Protocol 1 provisions, it was widely seen that environmental damage uh, incidental to conventional warfare would normally not be covered. It was not intended to be covered by the prohibition. And it's quite telling that experts still disagree, disagree whether this threshold has been reached in any conflict since 1977. It will be interesting to see whether this will change. As you may know, the International Criminal Court is uh, considering th the situation in Ukraine since 2014. And it may be, if it decides to consider uh, the destruction of the Novakahovka Dam last year, uh, as an environmental war crime within uh, the within the scope of Article Eight, this is something that Ukraine has asked the court to do. This could perhaps be the first time uh, that the high threshold has been undisputed, undisputably reached. Um, protection of the environment from uh, the dangers of war is thus not a new concern, but it has been addressed only sporadically. What is even more noteworthy is that the substantive provisions that are in place, apart from the Rome Statute provision, were adopted before uh, the development of the international environmental law as a branch of international law. In general, um, international environmental law and the law of armed conflict have developed separately. 
this has led to the protection of the environment uh, being a secondary concern in armed conflict. At the same time, it has made it quite challenging to identify the necessary connections between international environmental law and the law of armed conflict. There's a broad agreement among international lawyers and states as well on the continuity of international environmental conventions during armed conflict. The consensus is that international environmental law agreements do not uh, cease to apply ipso facto when uh, an armed conflict is uh, breaking out. But what it means in practice, how the environmental law obligations may, how they interact with the law of armed conflict, where they are in contradiction with it, each other, and how uh, they may be adjusted. So how the, when international law, international environmental law provisions conflict with the law of armed conflict provisions, when they may complement these law of armed conflict provisions or inform the application and inter interpretation of the international, uh, of the law of armed conflict provisions. And where the provisions of international environmental law may be, must be adjusted to the realities of war. These are the questions that continue, be, continue to be discussed within internet, among international lawyers. I will give you some examples uh, in this lecture about the interplay of international environmental law and the law of armed conflict, as this problem has been um, addressed in the PERA principles. As was pointed out, um, the ENMOD Convention, the additional uh, protocol two, uh, additional protocol one provisions and the environmental uh, war crime in the Rome Statute are the only uh, treaty law provisions that provide direct protection to the environment in um, conflict. More recent developments regarding envi the environment and armed um, conflict have taken another form and largely rely on the, on the interpretation of the existing rights and obligations. This is true to a certain extent uh, for the ILC's PERAC principles, which contribute to the clarification and codification of existing international law, but also contain provisions and proposals for its further development. Other legal initiatives that have borne fruit in recent years include, most notably, the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict, which were issued in 2020. These guidelines were presented as a restatement of law, and they con contain the authoritative view of the ICRC on how international humanitarian law protects the environment. Unlike in the past, the current uh, interest in the protection of the environment in and in relation to armed conflicts has not been triggered by any particular conflict. Even though I must add that the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine has made environmental consequences of warfare more visible than before. And this is something that may lead to new legal developments. But in general, the momentum that has been building up during the past 10 to 15 years, and which has sustained the work of the, uh, on the ILC principles, is mostly due to the fact that the direct and indirect um, effects, environmental effects of armed conflict 
are better understood than before, thanks to post-conflict environmental assessments and related research. This has also included a better understanding of how armed conflicts contribute to global environmental challenges, such as climate change or biodiversity loss, general environmental degradation. In this regard, it may be noted that over 80% of all major armed conflicts between 1950 and 2000 took place in biodiversity hotspots. Countries that endure armed conflicts are also on the forefront of climate change. Another statistic of the 25 countries that are most vulnerable to climate change and least ready to adapt, 14, more than half, are involved in armed conflict. I will now move on to the PERAC principles, discussing their scope, purpose, and the process in which they have been formulated. The defining feature of the ILC's PERAC principles is that is their uh, temporal scope, which covers the entire uh, life cycle of armed conflict from the time before uh, to the conflict phase and post-conflict situations, including situations of occupation. The broad temporal scope of the topic is also the reason why it is entitled Protection of the Environment in relation to armed conflicts. This scope reflects uh, the experience of modern armed conflicts. The clear majority of them are non-international armed conflicts, often with um, external intervention in support of one or more of the parties. Such conflicts may not have a clear end, or they may only end to ignite soon again. The transition from war to peace uh, may be a long process, and there are many challenges, such as those related to continued violence and instability, um, those related to unexploded weapons and the legacy of pollution, disintegration of state and local institutions, or perpetuation of conflict economies. The temporal scope of the principles also derives from the recognition that protection of the environment must, must be continuous from the time before the conflict, throughout the conflict and in post-conflict situations. Preventive measures are most likely to be effective if they are taken before the conflict breaks out. Environmental effects of armed conflict are continue to be felt in its aftermath, sometimes for decades or longer. Timely action to address these problems may prevent greater harm and facilitate uh, the transition to sustainable peace. In practice, the broad temporal scope of the ILC work means that the topic does not only focus on the obligations of the warring parties, but also seeks to clarify what obligations other non-belligerent states or international organizations may have, and what they could and should do to enhance environmental protection in relation to armed conflicts. The principles address questions concerning the conduct of hostilities, of course, but they also deal, for instance, with um, peace operations, humanitarian assistance, protection of the territories of indigenous peoples, and regulation of business entities. The purpose 
of the principles is to contribute to better protection of the environment throughout mm -hmm. the conflict cycle by defining measures to prevent, mitigate, and remediate environmental harm resulting from conflicts. While they include uh, a broad array of measures across the conflict life cycle, they do not intend to be comprehensive. Rather, the Commission has identified uh, issues that are particularly relevant for the protection of the environment in conflict affected areas. In this, it has profited from consultations with relevant expert organizations, including the UN Environment Program, uh, the UNESCO, and the International Committee of the Red Cross. And of course, it has profited from related research. Thanks to these consultations, the work on the topic has been able to rely uh, on the enhanced understanding of the direct and indirect effects of armed conflicts, whether these effects result from the conduct of hostilities or from the particular circumstances created by armed conflicts. From a legal point of view, the purpose of enhancement is consistent with the Commission's mandate to codify and progressively develop international law. At the same time, it indicates that the principles seek to contribute to a more coherent international legal framework for protecting the environment in relation to armed conflict in particular uh, through an integrated approach, which takes into account uh, other rules of international law in addition to the law of armed conflict. Already the broad focus of the ILC work has made it necessary to go beyond the law of armed conflict. The principles draw on other areas of international law particularly international human rights law and international environmental law. Both these areas of international law are obviously relevant in pre- and post-conflict situations, but they also have a role to play uh, during armed conflict, including and in particular in situations of occupation. It has often been said that this ILC topic lies at the intersection of international environmental law and the law of armed conflict. This is true to a certain extent, but there's also reason to highlight the role of international human rights law in this regard. The interconnections between the law of armed conflict and human rights law on the, on the one hand, and human rights law and the environment on the other have been widely and authoritatively recognized. The most recent example of the greening of human rights is the adoption of the UN General Assembly Resolution um, 76300 on the human right uh, to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment in 2022. A further feature worth mentioning is that the principles do not in general uh, distinguish between international armed conflicts and non-international armed conflicts. As you may know, this is a basic distinction uh, in the law of armed conflict. Most contemporary armed conflicts are non-international in nature. By mid-2022, it was estimated that there were more than 50 non-international armed conflicts in at least uh, 22 states. The law applicable to non-international armed conflicts, this is common article three, the Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocol 2 to the Geneva Conventions. 
this body of law is fairly uh, narrow and it does not provide direct protection uh, to the environment. In general, most of the treaty law uh, within the law of armed conflict only applies to international armed conflicts. The development of customary international law has nevertheless contributed to the harmonization of the two regimes, the IX and the NIX. Regarding the uh, PERAC principles, I should add that the distinction between uh, international and non-international armed conflicts is an aspect that only has relevance with regard to the principles applicable during armed conflict. Most of the 27 principles are thus unaffected by the classification of conflicts. Several of the principles address relevant actors or parties to a conflict using notions that include non-state armed groups and take into account, for instance, that um, it has been a common phenomenon in current uh, non-international armed conflicts that non-state armed groups exercise control over populations and territories, sometimes for a very long time and thereby um, have certain state-like uh, characteristics. In addition, uh, the PERAC principles include provisions that have practical relevance to uh, non-international armed conflicts. And I will give you a few examples later. Uh, finally, regarding the process in which the principles were formulated, uh, I should mention that the initiative for the topic came from a 2009 report of the UNEP, UN Environment Programme, which contained a number of recommendations. One of these recommendations asked the International Law Commission to examine the existing international law for protecting uh, the environment during armed conflict and recommend how it could be codified, clarified, codified, and expanded. The same report also recommended to the ICRC that it update its guidelines on the protection of the natural environment in armed conflict. The principles and commentaries are the result of roughly a decade's work in the Commission under two special rapporteurs. The first special rapporteur was uh, Dr. Marie Jakobsson from Sweden, who was the pen holder from 2013 to 2016. And uh, I followed her uh, from 2017 to 22. In addition to the process within uh, the Commission, I would also like to highlight the interaction with states, relevant international organizations, and other stakeholders, which has been a constant feature of the work on the topic. In accordance with its established procedures, the International Law Commission benefits from, from regular feedback from states. And this was also the case with the PERAC principles. As always happens, um, the second reading was preceded by a consultation period in which uh, states were invited to send in written comments on the first reading text. This time, and given the nature of the topic, uh, also international organizations and certain uh, uh, civil society organizations were asked to send in written comments, and many of them responded to this call. Uh, 
And as I already mentioned earlier, uh, the work on the topic has also benefited from uh, continuing consultations with relevant expert organizations. The process was completed in 2022, uh, first in the Commission and then in the UN General Assembly. The relevant um, General Assembly resolution uh, that was adopted in December uh, 2022 underlines the major importance of the subject for international relations and encourages states, international organizations and others to give the principles and commentaries the widest possible dissemination. After this uh, general overview, I will now turn to some of the principles. As already mentioned, and as it's not possible to go to all of them, I will focus on four clusters of principles. The first, first cluster consists of principles based on the law of armed conflict. There I would like to take up two issues. The first one, concerns uh, the civilian nature of the environment. And the second one, uh, the two articles of additional protocol one, which protect the natural environment from widespread long-term and severe damage. Let me nevertheless add that most of the 27 principles focus on environmental harm below that high threshold including harm that is caused inadvertently or by negligence, harmful practices, or harm caused by other actors than the parties to conflict. The ICRC guidelines, which have their primary focus on the time of armed conflict, uh, contain more comprehensive comp compilation of the different law of armed conflict provisions that provide protection to the environment. So the first example concerns the civilian nature of the environment. The commentary to the Perak principles uh, underlines the inherently civilian nature of the environment, explaining a provision that reads, no part of the environment may be attacked unless it has become a military objective. This is uh, principle 13, paragraph, th paragraph three. Uh, the ICRC guidelines also point out that it is generally recognized today that by default, the natural environment is civilian in character. The terms inherently and by default have the same function. They indicate that the protection is conditional and a particular part of the environment loses its protection if it becomes a military objective. <clears throat> The large part of the law of armed conflict rules, large part of the protection that the law of armed conflict rules uh, provide to the environment is dependent on the understanding of the environment as civilian in nature. As a consequence of the civilian nature of the environment, uh, the protections that civilian objects are entitled also apply to the environment. This is true, for instance, for the principles of distinction, uh, proportionality, and precautions, but also for many uh, more specific law of armed conflict rules. The understanding of the inherently civilian nature of the environment is today the prevailing mainstream view shared by most states and most scholars. It also gets support from 
the legal and political recognition of the interrelationship between uh, populations and the environment in which they live. Some of the other Perak principles also build on this understanding. For instance, principle nine on state responsibility, which confirms the principle of full preparation for environmental damage in relation to armed conflicts, including pure environmental damage in situations where uh, people or property have not been harmed. Similarly, um, the environmental Martens clause in principle uh, 12 uh, can be mentioned in this context. The real significance of the understanding of the environment as inherently civilian in nature may be better understood if I refer to the alternative. The alternative is represented by a minority view according to which only those parts of the environment in, on which civilians depend for their health and survival uh, can be or could be accorded a status of civilian object. Consequently, any environmental damage uh, that does not reach the threshold of being widespread, long-term and severe, would be compliant with the laws of armed conflict, provided that uh, the damage does not cause direct and foreseeable harm to the health and survival of civilians. Uh, let me add that this minority view relies on a very narrow understanding of the environment. While environmental effects of armed conflicts may sometimes be direct and may directly cause severe harm to humans, the criterion of direct and foreseeable harm to the health and survival of civilians uh, would leave out most of the environmental harm caused in conflict. This is also an approach that understates the value of uninhabited nature areas uh, that may be environmentally uh, vulnerable or uh, important. It excludes pure environmental damage. And this is in clear contradiction with uh, the current knowledge of ecological processes, but also with, it's also in conflict with the environmental obligations of states under international environmental law. On top of that, this minority uh, view also contrasts with the established understanding uh, in the law of armed conflict that all objects that are not military objectives are civilian objects. There's no uh, middle category. The criterion of uh, direct and foreseeable harm to the health and survival of civilians is also quite unpractical as armed forces would have to assess in each particular situation, not only the effect of the attack on the environment, but also how the environmental damage would affect the health of civilians. The other issue regarding the principles applicable during armed conflict concerns the standard of widespread, long-term, and severe, which, as you know, appears uh, in the two environmental provisions in uh, additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions. We could actually go back to this, this slide. Uh, both the ICRC guidelines and the PERAC principles contain provisions modeled after the additional protocol one rules and the Enmont convention and comment on their status and interpretation. 
And obviously, e even though these provisions um, set a very high threshold, they do have value in that the high threshold uh, is an absolute limit to, to the environmental harm caused in conflict. As far as additional protocol one is concerned, in the Rome Statute rule, it's not absolute because you also have to have the proportionality uh, assessment, the harm in addition to being widespread, long-term and severe should be clearly excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated. This standard widespread, long-term and severe is also quite unclear. It has not been defined in additional protocol one and it does not have an equivalent in international environmental law. The PERAC principles do not give definitions to the terms widespread, long-lasting, or long-term and severe either. But uh, the commentary highlights the need when assessing uh, the practical implications of the two provisions. Uh, to take into account current scientific knowledge and understanding of ecological processes. The commentary points out that uh, in the interpretation of this standard, widespread, long-lasting, long-term and severe, uh, you cannot only rely on how the concept of environmental damage was understood in the 70s. In this regard, the commentary continues. The risk of damage should be should not be conceptualized only in terms of harm to a specific object, but should also take into account any indirect or cumulative effects and the possibility that the fragile interdependent system of both living and non-living components may be affected. The ICRC guidelines contain a similar comment about the need to consider, I quote, current knowledge, including on the connectedness and interrelationships of different parts of the natural environment, as well as on the, the effects of the harm caused, unquote. The ICRC guidelines also uh, expand on how the three terms should be uh, interpreted. The second uh, cluster of principles consists of those applicable in situations of occupation. The relevant uh, principles 19, 20, 21 spell out the environmental obligations of an occupying power towards the occupied population, uh, the occupied state, as well as other state, uh, states and the international community as a whole. One of the objectives of the Commission's work on the PERAC topic has been to clarify how existing international law protects the environment in relation to armed conflicts. It was obvious that there was a need for such clarification regarding uh, the law of occupation, given that the primary legal instruments, the 1907 Hague, regula Hague Regulations and the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, um, obviously lack specific provisions on the protection of the environment. At the same time, um, most of the uh, relevant rules of the law of occupation are general in nature. They have proved uh, flexible enough to be adapted to changing circumstances, and their, their interpretation has developed considerably in recent decades. It is well established for instance, that uh, international human rights law complements uh, 
the law of occupation. These three principles are based, the two first are based on the law of occupation, existing customary law of obligations, which have been interpreted in light of subsequent developments and uh, subsequent developments in international law, both human rights law and international environmental law. The third one uh, is based also on a customary uh, international law principle in environmental law. The first of these principles, principle 19, sets forth the general obligations of an occupying power. First, the, the obligation to respect and protect the environment of the occupied territory and take environmental considerations into account uh, in the administration of such territory. The provision is based on the occupying powers uh, obligation to take care of the welfare of the occupied population, derived from Article 43 of the Hague Regulations. It has often been said that Article 43 <clears throat> contains an obligation to ensure that the occupied population uh, lives as normal life as possible in the prevailing circumstances. And what the ILC has added is that normal life necessarily entails protection of the environment, which is widely recognized as one of the core functions of a modern state. Uh, moreover, uh, environmental concerns uh, relate to an essential interest of the territorial sovereign, which uh, the occupying state as a temporary authority must respect. This provision, uh, principle 19, also provides that an occupying uh, power shall take appropriate measures to prevent significant harm to the environment of the occupied territory, including harm that is uh, likely to prejudice uh, the health and well-being of the protected persons, or otherwise uh, violate their rights. Here, the reference to the rights of the protected persons um, is to be understood to cover both uh, their rights under the law of occupation and their human rights. It is well known and confirmed by uh, human rights courts that significant harm to the environment uh, may seriously affect the enjoyment of several human rights, such as the right to life, right to health, or right to food. The third aspect of uh, Principle 19 is that it requires an occupying power to respect the law and institutions of the occupied territory concerning the protection of the environment. The specific content of this obligation is dependent on the circumstances and the environmental legislation of the occupied territory, also of the uh, international obligations of the occupied states adherence to international conventions. The second principle, principle uh, 20, relates to the use of natural resources of an occupied territory. The provision is based on Article 55 of the Hague Regulations. Uh, Article 55 uh, regards the occupying power as an administrator and usufructuary of immovable public property in the occupied territory. The, this descrip description 
has uh, traditionally been interpreted uh, to forbid wasteful or negligent destruction of the capital value, whether by excessive cutting or mining or other abusive exploitation. So it can be seen um, as a standard of good housekeeping, basically. The Commission agreed in this regard that uh, the established right of usufruct has to be interpreted in light of the well-established concept of sustainability. Sustainable use of natural resources in the occupied territory was recognized as the modern equivalent of user trust. Principle 20 states that an occupying power, when it is legally permitted to do so, and obviously as a temporary authority, um, the occupying power can only exploit the natural resources within certain limits. When doing so, it must administer and use the natural resources of the occupied territory in a way that ensures their sustainable use and minimizes environmental harm. The third principle, uh, principle 21, states that an occupying power shall take appropriate measures to ensure that uh, the activities within the occupied territory do not cause significant transboundary harm to the environment. This is the established principle of prevention, according to which all states should ensure, shall ensure that activities in their territory of control do not cause significant harm to the environment of other states or areas beyond uh, national jurisdiction. The applicability of this principle to territories under occupation has also been firmly established. Applied specifically to situations of occupation, the principle also protects uh, any area of the occupied states that lies beyond the occupied territory. The broad scope of uh, the topic has also directed the Commission to identify environmental issues that are cross-cutting uh, through the different phases of the conflict cycle. In this regard, I would like to take up two examples of such issues. The first is uh, illegal and unsustainable uh, exploitation of natural resources. And the other one concerns uh, responsibility and remediation. A common problem in resource-rich countries is that routing of natural resources is accelerated in situations of armed conflict. And it also tends to prolong the conflicts. According to UNEP, 40% of internal armed conflicts over the past 60 years were related to natural resources. And a link to natural resources uh, doubles the risk uh, of a conflict relapse within the first five years. Armed um, conflicts are also increasingly part of global environmental crime. As you can see, altogether five uh, of the PERAC principles are relevant to the protection of natural resources from environmentally harmful or unsustainable exploitation. They address this problem from different angles. Of these um, principle 16, the prohibition of pillage. Um, this is prohibition of pillage is an 
established customary international law rule. It is applicable uh, in international and non-international armed conflicts. It protects all natural resources that uh, can be uh, subject to ownership and constitute property. In situations of occupation, uh, the prohibition of pillage forms an absolute limit to the exploitation of the natural resources uh, of an occupying, occupied territory by the occupying power or by private actors uh, within the area under the occupying power's effective control. At the same time, the principles relative to occupation, which we just discussed, take into account more long-term uh, environmental degradation linked to harmful occupation practices. As already mentioned, one of them, uh, Principle 20, um, seeks to protect the natural resources of the occupied territory from excessive and unsustainable use. To further uh, principles uh, on due diligence by business enterprises and liability of business enterprises are relevant in the context of illegal exploitation of natural resources in conflict affected areas, given the role that uh, business enterprises may have in perpetuating conflict economies and in causing environmental harm. Businesses, of course, often uh, make a positive contribution to post-conflict reconstruction. But there are examples of excessive exploitation, harmful to the environment and human health, facilitated by the governance challenges and lack of regulatory oversight that are typical in conflict-affected contexts. The two principles, um, 10 and 11, uh, address the legislative and other measures that states can take uh, with a view to ensuring that uh, business enterprises and their subsidiaries uh, exercise due diligence in conflict-affected areas and can be held liable when they cause harm to the environment. As these princi principles address both home and host states of business enterprises, they entail an element of extraterritoriality. This is particularly clear in a scenario in which uh, the home state exercises its enforcement jurisdiction in line with principle 11. I mentioned earlier that the topic does not only uh, focus on the obligations of the warring parties. Some measures are in fact most effective if they are taken by other states than those involved in the conflict. The two principles on business enterprises are a case in point. While these provisions uh, address both home and host states of business enterprises. Uh, it can be said that home states are often in a better position to provide adequate and effective procedures and remedies for the victims of environmental harm. The commentary of principle 11 recalls in this regard that collapse of state and local institutions is a common consequence of armed conflict and one that undermines law enforcement and protection of rights, as well as integrity of uh, justice, also in the aftermath of an armed conflict. The last principle in this cluster uh, addresses the inadvertent effects of conflict-induced human displacement. 
population displacement is a typical consequence of an outbreak of armed conflict, and one that may give rise to significant uh, human suffering, as well as considerable environmental damage. The environmental damage being mainly related to the use of natural resources for food and shelter, poaching of uh, wild animals, uh, for instance. Uninformed decisions uh, concerning the siting of a refugee camp in or near a fragile or international protected area may result in irreversible local and distant uh, environmental impact. As happened, for instance, when people displaced by the Rwandan genocide sought shelter in a natural park in the neighboring DRC. A study on the protection of the environment during armed conflict notes that massive uh, conflict-induced displacement of civilian populations may have even more destructive effects on the environment than actual combat operations. The relevant principle on human displacement is a prominent example of a provision that reflects a broader understanding of the problems of armed conflicts and the environment. It asks states, international organizations, and other relevant actors, while providing relief to persons displaced by conflict, to take measures to prevent and mitigate environmental degradation in areas where they are, they are located. The principles, principle also includes a reference to local and host communities on the understanding that better environmental governance increases resilience for host communities, uh, displaced persons, and the environment as such. Regarding these cluster of principles, um, I would like to add that a major research project by the UNEP, the UNDP, and the World Bank uh, has identified six principal pathways for direct environmental harm in non-international armed conflicts. Illegal and unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, and the inadvertent uh, environmental effect of human displacement are both among them. As the last issue, I will discuss responsibility and remediation. The picture is from the effects of the destruction of the Novakakhovka dam in Ukraine last year. In this regard, I would first like to highlight principle nine, paragraph one, uh, on state responsibility. This principle restates uh, the fundamental rule that every internationally wrongful act uh, of a state entails its international responsibility and gives rise to an obligation to make full reparation. The principle reaffirms that this general rule of the law of state responsibility also applies in relation to armed conflicts and in relation to environmental damage. The principle furthermore specifies that this is also the case for pure environmental damage in situations where uh, people or property have not been harmed. The principle and its commentary draw on the recent jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice on all, all these points. The commentary also recalls the court's statements regarding the special responsibility of an aggressor state and the special responsibility of an occupying power. 
according to the International Court of Justice, an aggressor state is responsible for all damage that can be established to have a sufficiently direct and certain causal nexus to its violation of the prohibition of the use of force. What is particularly noteworthy is that uh, this responsibility to be established, no, there's no need to prove that the law of armed conflict has been violated, that war crimes have been committed. The violation of the law of the use of force is sufficient. As far as an occupying power is concerned, uh, it has a duty of vigilance to prevent violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law, not only by its own armed forces, but also by any third parties within its control. Let me add that while this jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice uh, may be relevant for the ongoing efforts to hold Russia accountable for the damage it has caused to the environment in Ukraine, the Ukraine, co Ukraine case also illustrates the challenges with regard to implementation of state responsibility in relation to armed conflicts. Given that the Russian Federation has not consented to the general jurisdiction of the court, International Court of Justice, it can only be taken to International Court of Justice uh, by virtue of uh, compromissory clauses in uh, individual uh, treaties, which often provides a very narrow base for jurisdiction, as we have recently seen. And of course, the Russian Federation also is a permanent member with veto right in the UN Security Council. Let me nevertheless finish this example with a positive note, highlighting the cooperation of the government of Ukraine with relevant international organizations, donor states, and civil society actors in order to collect and document evidence of environmental damage caused in this conflict, as well as, as, well as developing uh, uh, methodologies for evaluating such environmental damage. This also um, leads us to a number of other principles uh, that are relevant in the context of restoration and remediation. They complement uh, the principle of state responsibility and address the issue of remediation from a pragmatic point of view, taking into account that all environmental damage in armed conflict does not result from violations of the international law. And also that Either there are situations in which uh, the responsible actor cannot be identified or situations in which there's no way to implement the responsibility and obtain preparation. These three principles uh, deal with sharing and granting access to environmental information, post-conflict environmental assessments, and remedial measures, as well as relief and assistance. Most notably, these three principles are not only addressed to the parties or former parties to a conflict, but also to other states or in international organizations that are in the position to provide information or remedy. As promised, I would like to conclude my observations with some thoughts on the way forward regarding protection of the environment in and in relation to armed conflicts. As far as the Perak principles are concerned, 
And given that they were prepared very much in consultation with states and international organizations, it can be hoped that uh, these actors will find the final outcome useful and take steps to consult it and implement it in their practice. In fact, there are examples of this already. I am also confident that the work to clarify the content and scope of the existing obligations will continue. International courts and tribunals have a special role in this regard. The International Court of Justice, for instance, has already in an important way uh, clarified the international law applicable to environmental damage and reparations in armed conflict. As far as the International Criminal Court is concerned, the first case of environmental uh, crime is still to come, but maybe in, in the making. What the Russian war in Ukraine has highlighted is the need to strengthen the mechanism, mechanisms for sanctioning non-compliance and implementation of responsibility for violations of the law, including accountability for environmental damage. This includes the ongoing efforts to hold Russia accountable for the damage it has caused in Ukraine. Inspiration can be drawn in this regard from the few successful cases in which the aggressor's responsibility including for environmental damage, has been established and compensation has been paid. The most notable cases in this regard, as you may know, are the establishment of the UN Compensation Commission uh, after the invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq. This was uh, part of the Security Council's practice and the recent reparations judgment of the ICJ in the armed activities case between the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Uganda. Um, regarding substantive international law, there would be a need to further uh, develop regulation at the national, regional, or international level regarding activities in relation to armed conflict, whether concerning due diligence and liability of business enterprises, establishment of protected zones, uh, reducing the environmental footprint of military activities, or other relevant measures, many of which have been identified in the PERAC principles. And there's also a need to further harmonize the legal framework applicable in international and non-international armed conflicts. As far as legal scholarship is concerned, there's a need for further study of the interplay of international environmental law and the law of armed conflict. Specific thematic areas for further research could also include, for instance, the effects of climate change and gendered impacts of armed conflict. What makes me optimistic in this regard is that during the past 10 years, roughly the time the ILC principles were in the making, environmental protection in and in relation to armed conflicts has grown substantially. It used to be a niche area of limited interest to international lawyers, but now I would say it has become a trending topic. For instance, um, when the International Review of the Red Cross uh, launched a call of papers, uh, that was the fall of uh, autumn of uh, 2022. Call of papers in view of its special issue 
on the protection of the environment, which came out uh, a few months ago. It received almost 150 abstracts from all parts of the world. The scholarly interest in the broad topic of the environment and armed conflicts has also led to codification of uh, legal principles related to the protection of water infrastructure, these are the Geneva principles, or assistance to victims and other specific areas, numerous new legal treatises and articles. So there's much reason to be optimistic, at least as far as uh, legal scholarship is concerned. Now I think I could stop, and we still have uh, at least 15 minutes for questions and answers, please. We will take a few questions from the room, but we also have a few questions online as well. Um, so raise your hand, come in first if you would like a question. Yes, we have a first question. I think, uh, sorry, um, I don't know if Monica makes a lot of sense, but um, I was wondering if data has been collected to acknowledge how the climate change is a growing trigger phenomenon for armed conflicts, uh, such as droughts, inundations, or increasing tensions in regions. Has a lot of data been collected to recognize this so far? There's certainly research on. Uh, environmental problems, including climate change, as a trigger of conflicts. But I must say that this was something outside the scope of the, the ILC work, mm -hmm. and actually outside the scope of my, my lecture as well. Because okay. um, this is mostly about during armed conflict, whether chemical weapons or uh, certain military tactics have mm. like, promoted uh, environmental degradation. But if you are interested in the in the work of the International Law Commission, there's a topic that may be of interest in this regard, and that's the topic of the sea level rise in relation to international law. They are looking at the, the consequences of sea level rise, sea level rise, um, and especially uh, from three uh, different angles. The first is the law of the sea, the second is protection of populations, and the third uh, is uh, issues of statehood. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> and obviously there, there are many uh, references to environmental effects as well. Are there any other questions from the room? So we have three questions online as well. Um, just will open it there. I think there's one more coming, so there's four now. Yes. If you would like to read that. Thank you. The first question comes from Anna Avan Avanasieva. Um, is there a link between environmental law and the law of armed conflict with the climate change law in the international treaties? Um, this is one of the areas where I uh, recommend uh, further research. The climate change law was also excluded from the IOC's work when it began in 2013. Obviously, partly because there was another topic concerning the protection of the atmosphere at the time. Um, in general, there are a few provisions in the existing international environmental law treaties uh, that somehow take into account situations of armed conflict. Um, but they require a lot of interpretation. The World Heritage Convention is the most explicit one. And the Paris Agreement also, as far as I 
can understand contains a number of contains some provision that uh, is relevant for armed conflicts. But this was not part of the part of the research done in the International Law Commission. But I can give you a more uh, uh, detailed answer if, 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 if you send me this question by by email. I'm, I'm sure you can get my email from from uh, the organizers. But in general, I would say that this is an area where more research is needed and also more integration of the relevant obligations. Perhaps in the in the uh, phase of implementation and application rather than uh, in, in, in the development of new provisions. The second question comes from Jennifer Borong. Criminalizing ecocide at the international level shows potential in preventing ecological destruction arising from armed conflict. How and in what conditions ecocide can be successfully included in the Rome Statute? Um, as you may know, there's a proposal to include ecocide as one of the Rome Statute crimes. Uh, the proposal has been made a couple of years ago uh, in the Assembly of States Parties of the Rome Statute uh, by Vanuatu. And uh, there's some support for the proposal, but in the, in the ordinary course of events, it would take quite some time before uh, the necessary majority is uh, achieved in the Assembly of States Parties the necessary support for the proposal. And even then, if you speak of a new crime, uh, it would be binding all, only on those states' parties who ratify the amendment. That may happen. Uh, I do have one uh, additional concern, and it's about the Rome Statute crimes as they stand now, crimes against uh, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, aggression. They all are based on crimes that, are, that have a customary law status, crimes under international law. Ecocide would be a new crime. And taking it first to the Rome Statute would be against the practice of relying on customary law crimes. So my personal view is that it would be good to first begin by drafting a separate criminal law convention on ecocide. And later on, on that basis, uh, trying to, seeking to add it to the Rome Statute crimes. But I know that there's a sense of urgency as with so many other environmental problems and probably this answer is not a satisfactory one. Uh, the definition of ecocide that was uh, put forward by the International Panel of Jurists would be applicable, um, I understand, both in armed conflict and in times of peace. And obviously, should that uh, the proposal be taken forward, either in a criminal law convention or ultimately in, in the Rome Statute, it would considerably expand the basis for uh, of jurisdiction for uh, prosecuting environmental crime. No, no doubt about that. But let's see, it may take some time. Um, the third question, Um, is regarding principle nine, paragraph one, uh, on state responsibility and the obligation to fully repair any damage that is caused. How can you fully repair any environmental damage 
when we take into account that some damages to biodiversity are irreversible and mean that biodiversity is lost forever. And also taking into consideration that it is hard to give a price to the environment. How can reparation be full in these conditions? Uh, and thank you to all of you uh, for these questions. Um, there's some, obviously these are very relevant questions. How can we speak of full uh, reparation uh, in these conditions? What I would say first is that there is some practice, especially from the UN Compensation Commission that was uh, established after the invasion and occupation of Kuwait by Iraq. And a lot of environmental lawyers worked with uh, the commission and they developed uh, methods for valuation of environmental damage. And actually the Compensation Commission paid uh, quite a lot of compensations to uh, different parties, Kuwait, but also third, uh, third states, neighboring states and, and other actors. And so there, there is some practice. Um, we can also refer to the practice of the International Court of Justice. And as I said, um, Ukraine, is developing methodologies for uh, assessing and evaluating uh, environmental damage caused in conflict, together with uh, uh, expert organizations and civil society actors. Um, the, the articles on state responsibility also uh, they they. The point of departure is full reparation, but they recognize that when restoration is not possible, there's a possibility of compensation. And even though it may be difficult, full reparation is the point of departure and it should be the objective. But mm -hmm. It's a very it's very good to take up and uh, the person who asked this question uh, is very right in the fact that there are many many complications in uh, the area of environmental damage when you try to uh, implement this principle. But as I am a lawyer, I don't go to the um, technical. Uh, complications uh, implicit in the issue. Yeah. Other questions? There's another question. This one, I think I already answered. The question from Leo Gotarta. Is there any other questions from the room? Yes, there's three. Yes. <laughs> Um, given how little practice there is so far, like how much expertise would you say there is on this in international courts and tribunals? And I mean, you mentioned, for example, the ICC, I was on, but which other ones, like which ones are the ones we should look to at the moment? Where do you think there might be some progress happening in terms of actually applying and developing this, this field of law? Obviously, there are, for instance, arbitration tribunals who have, well, there are many, many numerous environmental cases when you don't speak of armed conflicts. And the evaluation of the environmental damage and the methods for evaluating environmental damage, they have been developed in, in these contexts and could be also used in, in a context of an armed conflict. Um, as I said, the International Court of Justice has a few relevant case, cases. 
Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, construction of a road. Uh, the armed activities case uh, between DRC and Uganda. And more to come, I would say. For the International Criminal Court, that is one of the hurdles. But uh, the Office of the Prosecutor said already in 2016 that uh, it would give a priority to cases in which uh, wrong statute crimes have been committed uh, using destruction of the environment as a means or that destruction of the environment is a result of those crimes. And there's a new uh, statement by the current chief prosecutor. Uh, he gave it maybe a month ago, in which he also said that he would give priority to environmental crimes. And in this regard, I think it's important to say, and this is also related to the ECOSAC question, that many of the uh, crimes currently under the ICC's jurisdiction uh, have environmental aspects. Destruction of the environment can qualify as, a, as an act of crimes against humanity. It can even qualify as an act of genocide, and uh, this was recognized in the uh, in the Al Bashir case concerning Darfur. In that case, the question was about poisoning wells, for instance. So uh, given these statements, I believe that uh, the necessary uh, expertise would be available to the court, International Criminal Court. So at least these three are relevant. Arbitration tribunals, um, the ICC, the ICC. Okay, and then, no. and then uh, the historical legacy of the UN Compensation Commission. Are they already? Like, for example, with the um, crimes against humanity, the report, like the ICC is already like investigating it in, in real time now. Are there efforts to do that with environmental crimes as well? Or like, I don't know. Okay. This is <laughs> this has not been publicized, mm -hmm. and the court, of course, is an independent institution. But as I said. Um, it is not excluded that uh, the court would look at the destruction of the Novaka Hovka Dam in the context of the situation in Ukraine. And there are also uh, environmental uh, aspects to other situations that are currently under consideration by the court. All right. We'll see. I think the next question is from um, Yaris. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that uh, there was the dissenting opinion uh, about the narrow uh, definition of the environment. So I was wondering, uh, in general, in broader uh, general understanding in uh, environment, uh, international law, how it broadly is the environment defined and is it as broadly as possible or is there certain limitations that seem to be counted out? Thank you. Um, uh, in the ICRC guidelines for the protection of the natural environment in armed conflicts, they use this term, and it's also used in the ICRC commentary to Additional Protocol 1, that the notion of natural environment should be understood to be as wide as possible. As far as the Perak principles are concerned, there's no definition of the environment. And um, um, if you look at my second report, uh, there I give it. There I explain a little bit why 
uh, I proposed that there should be no definition of the environment. In nutshell, the problem was that any definition that the INC could have taken would be outdated as the research goes on. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I just thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to kind of ask how, uh, let's say, the formulation of the right to a health environment, mm. which is not protected so far in international treaties, could uh, bridge the gap, as you like often mentioned during the presentation, between the law of armed conflict and uh, international environmental law, for instance. It would certainly help. As I said, that the greening of human rights law has already uh, strengthened the protections to the environment in armed conflict. Um, the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment, as you said, uh, has been recognized by uh, almost all states in, in the UN General Assembly. But it needs to be anchored in uh, in in the jurisprudence of the courts and tribunals mm -hmm. before becoming really a, a legal principle, the customary law. But um, human rights law has a very important role to to fill in the gaps in the protections provided by the law of armed conflict, and I'm. Um, I would say that uh, the recent efforts, both the ICRC guidelines and, and and the International Commission's work on the PERAC topic, have uh, have changed the general understanding of how to approach these issues. Yes. Um, I do have a question in regards to um, maybe would, would this principle extend the jurisdiction of Western countries to intervene in conflicts that uh, don't uh, well, don't concern them or um, give them additional power to uh, claim responsibility for this conflict or the civilians that are there as in uh, uh, a sort of uh, neo-colonial approach to uh, Are you referring to uh, um, particular so principles or in general the idea of other states and those in than those involved in conflict, the role given to them by the birth principles? Um, mostly in, in general. In general. Um, in this regard, I would say that in many principles, for instance, one on human displacement, um, it's addressed to states, international organizations, and other relevant actors, including civil society actors, those who normally give humanitarian assistance, that they should take into account the environmental effects and try to minimize them. Mm -hmm. That's one. I, there, I, I don't see that much of a, of the neo-colonial attitude. Maybe what you say is most applicable to principle 11, where we speak of enforcement of jurisdiction by the home states of business enterprises. And that was an issue that was also discussed by the commission. But it was thought that given the record of uh, corporations and other business enterprises causing severe environmental harm in, in conflict-affected areas. We should give this opportunity. And there's also, there are quite many uh, cases also referred to in the commentary to principle 11, where uh, national courts in home states have been able to provide uh, remedy and compensation to the victims of the environmental harm. In situations where the uh, courts of the, the judicial system of the host state 
would be unable to do so. But this is an aspect. And it's also uh, an easy criticism, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, are aggressor countries actually taking into consideration the legal framework um, regarding the environmental protection? Or are they rather preparing to face the consequences uh, of their actions during, before and during the art concert, uh, based on the cases that are already existing? There are a few cases where aggressor states have uh, faced the justice and uh, ended up paying compensation. Uh, the Iraq Kuwait case is the first one. Uh, the Uganda DRC is the other one. But when we speak of uh, the, the ongoing armed conflict in Ukraine, obviously there are Quite a bit big problems when, as I said, uh, the Russian Federation has not recognized the ICJ's general jurisdiction, and it is it sits as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, which means that the UN Security Council cannot fulfill its charter-based role. Um, but there are efforts um, to. Uh, establish a court of aggression. And if that if, if that succeeds, then possibly some uh, revenues could be uh, obtained in that way and that could be directed to uh, rebuilding Ukraine, including uh, a green transition. But let's say that the existing international law rules, especially the UN Charter, is very much based on the idea that uh, the permanent members of the Security Council follow the rules. When they don't, we are always in a difficult situation. I think we have time for just one or two more questions, and there's two on the chat. Um, actually, one. There's an anonymous attendee. In my opinion, it is a bit strange, but it seems that we uh, the NATO countries represent the good guys, and the Russians are obviously the bad guys of our narratives, and due to the acts of them in Ukraine, there is international ecocide debate going on or not? Uh, question mark. A little bit a historical interpretation of the issue. Now, I am not quite sure what uh, this anonymous attendee speaks about. Um, Ukraine is a current conflict that I have taken as an example for several several reasons. One of them being the fact that environmental uh, devastation in conflict has become more visible than in earlier conflicts. Because of the active role that Ukraine has taken, you may know that um, protection of the environment and restoration of the environment is one uh, part uh, President Zelensky's uh, peace formula. Uh, they have also, there's a lot of uh, activity going on uh, using new technologies and, as I said, developing methodologies for uh, uh, documenting the environmental damage that has been caused. But obviously, there are other examples. These are not the only ones. I have mentioned uh, the Rwandan genocide, I have mentioned uh, uh, the Ugandan aggression in DRC. Um, we can speak of Gaza. There are environmental effects also in urban areas. Um, 
And as far as uh, the other part of the question is concerned, I don't think I have spoken of any good guys in this, this context. But as an international lawyer, I think it's my task to defend the international legal order, which unfortunately, Russian Federation has violated in a most flagrant way. I think we're almost done. Um, yeah, uh, there's just one question off the top. I see another question, yes. Uh, it's about uh, the environmental crimes committed by uh, armed groups or paramilitary groups. Um, actually, the focus of the Perak principles is not on environmental crimes. Uh, the focus is on uh, obligations of states, international organizations states and international organizations. And then there are recommendations to other actors on what they can do. Um, but uh, regarding uh, non-state armed groups, there are different kinds of them. Some of the non-state armed groups actually have uh, rules for environmental protection of their own. Then there are armed groups that uh, this uh, question mentions um, paramilitary para groups used by used in the Russian for war in Ukraine. Um, maybe I could end by saying that uh, there's a lot of work going on with non-state armed groups, and I would be happy if some of the Perak principles could be used for developing uh, deeds of commitment for non-state armed groups. This is the work done by an organization's organization entitled Geneva Call. And they have been proposals to use uh, the Perak principles as, as a basis for uh, commitments by non-state armed groups regarding the protection of the environment. Thank you so much. Can we have a big round of applause for that? Now, I'd also like to thank those joining us online for your participation and for the interactive session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, please. How many of them have one last time? I think that's a lot of